For most successful pro athletes, their lives have been defined by the sports they play. Careers full of triumphs, defeats, and compelling drama. I had this moment like I couldn't even get on a local club to get a bicycle and a jersey. Why? Then nobody knew who I was. But when it's time to step away from that competition, the transition to retirement presents a new set of challenges. I was starting to wind down my racing career, planning the next phase, which was working at the lumber mill in Durango. <laughs> As former stars embark on the next stages of life, their journeys are well known, but sometimes there's more to the story. Wait a minute, I, I was supposed to drop out. So the next day, the whole peloton was like, I can't believe that guy is still in this race. It's impossible. It could not wipe me out. <laughs> As we go off script. The life of a pro cyclist is like no other. It is unique, and so is he. Bob Roll has conquered many of the great landscapes this planet has to offer, and he's done it all on two wheels. Cresting the Grand Mountains of Alpe d'Huez, winning over his fans with his prodigious mutton chops, and earning a place in the realm of cult classics with his impetuous ramblings that seem to be spawned from the spirit of Hunter S. Thompson himself. Let's say hello to Bob Roll. Bob, welcome. Thank you. I was channeling my inner Bob Roll there a little bit. Do you approve? <laughs> I approve 100%. <laughs> One thing that I know about you is you are unapologetically unfiltered no matter no, no matter the surroundings. Or if worse. we're on TV, <laughs> if we're at dinner, if we're sitting here. W where did that come from? Yeah, I think as kids, we were encouraged to express ourselves. And our family, four kids, two parents, every meal together. No internet, no TV, nothing, no radio. If the phone rang, this is before... Right. This is before answering machines, so we just let it ring. And my dad would always say, if it's important, they'll call back after dinner. But during dinner, and each kid had to tell a story of what happened to them during the day. It sounds like you had a family that, that welcomed your personality, but you also oh, yeah, grew absolutely. up in an area that was unlike any other, 60s and 70s yeah. in the Bay Area, yeah. uh, this epicenter of yeah. all these countercultures, hippie spirit, yeah. free love, racial diversity, racial yeah. tension, Black Panthers, Grateful Dead, Hell's Angels, it was all right there on top of you. H how did it affect who you became? Well, it, we thought it was normal. Because <laughs> when you grow up there and you're a kid, it's just like, that's the day-to-day. -day. Uh, so that, that uh, it made me think about other people's perspective and think about um, the diversity that our country has. So growing up there at that time was, was really critical to the way I look at the world. And my, my part of the Bay Area, the Diablo Valley, was like a warren of cul-de-sacs surrounded by orchards. And there was like 200 kids within three or four blocks. How diverse. Oh, we had the whole melting pot in this this area we had the best times growing up there and you know this is a time when kids were ushered out of the right. house in the morning and did not want to be seen again Come back for dinner for dinner yeah. so so we were left to our own devices and it was fantastic we invented every game imaginable and we yeah. just just had a great time with each other and it developed my sense of you know joy of being outside and competing with each other in all sorts of uh, you know, things, and that was, it was an absolutely phenomenal, fantastic place and time to grow up. So in Oakland, for someone who, who liked the outdoors, who liked competition, the Oakland A's were winning World yeah, Series. Yeah, that's right. Oakland Raiders were peaking at that time. And they came into the classroom, and there's been The A's Raiders and the A's? Yeah. And you're like, oh my God, I just saw him on TV. Yeah. This is awesome. Came into your classroom yeah. to do what? Just hang out, say hi. Really? Yeah. Hey, kids. Stay in school. <laughs> who was, was your favorite? Awesome. Who was your favorite visitor? Uh, Vita Blue. Yeah, very good picture. very cool. You have the A's, not only winning, but you're interacting with them. The yeah. Raiders, same thing. Yeah. How does someone who likes competition, likes being outside, end up going to cycling? Well, if you're good at those sports, you would probably. <laughs> you tried football and baseball. I did play football. Played baseball, pretty good, you know. But it didn't it didn't pique my interest really. It didn't. It wasn't a full circle of uh, what I was looking for. What about cycling it. right cycling, away, pique your yeah. interest? The freedom. You're outside, you're going somewhere. Uh, the miles themselves are like the skull drudgery of training are absolutely phenomenal. They're so much fun. Mm -hmm. Hill and Dale through the countryside. Just you are, it's like the most democratic machine outside of the voting box. It's pure freedom. 
you're left to your own power as far as you can go. You're like two pieces of licorice and five raisins. I could ride to <laughs> Reno, Nevada. Right. Sleep in the side of the road, have a cheeseburger and a milkshake and ride home. I just loved it. It was awesome. Didn't you just do that this past summer from <laughs> from San Francisco? I did that to just Mexico a few days with ago. like three blueberries? Yeah. Well, I had a little bit more than that. Skull drudgery, you said? I mean, think about the training. Yeah. You know, the hour after hour after hour. Like for an NBA player to shoot the percentage of free throws that they're capable of making during the playoffs, just think of how many hours they have to spend practicing the free throw, which doesn't change. The scenery does not change. Right. The gym might be a little bit different, but when you're training for bike racing, you every single day is an adventure. How old were you when you realized that you really liked that? That was probably 20, 19, 20. 19 so, or 20. Yeah. So that was a little bit late coming into the sport to be to have gotten to a high, the highest level, mm -hmm. but it was like instant. I just took to it immediately. I've heard a story that you started riding a bike to, to beat traffic in the <laughs> Bay Area to get to work. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. I had a short order cook job yeah. in in the swing shift, and a construction job, you know, in the morning. I came across the Berkeley Bike Club on their training rides during my commute, and they're like, "We we have this this training race. You should do that," you know. And I would like racing them in my work clothes and uh, lunch box, you know, boots, like work boots. <laughs> and I was just like going to work. <laughs> I'm like, there's the bike. I'm going to race these dudes. <laughs> and they're like, what in the hell are you doing? <laughs> so they're like, oh, my God, that guy's pretty strong. And they're like, you should do this race. We have a race every Thursday night, Hagenberger Road, south of the Oakland Airport, Industrial Park Crit. And they collect all the, like, $3, $5 to enter, and they put it in a pot. And I thought it was like a running race. So right at the start, I took off, and they never caught me. So I got the pot. It was $82. Mm. It was the first time I thought I had won the lottery. So that's how it started. That's how it started. So the journey has been a big part of how I look at the world. Yeah. And I'd much rather get there on my bike. Right. When did you start having success at high-level competitions in California? That was pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> first few races. Okay. Do you yeah. remember winning your first race, your first big yeah, race? Yeah, first big race was maybe a year after I started riding, and they had announced a race up Mount Diablo, which has been used in the Amgen Tour of California a number of times. I told my club mates on the Berkeley Bike Club, I'm winning that. And they're like, you're not winning that. And all the best pros in the country showed up, and I smoked them. And that was the first big win that got the attention of 7-Eleven and the other because they were there, mm -hmm. beat all those guys. And, and How did you go from someone who enjoyed the training, enjoyed the freedom, but all of your peers said you have no chance of winning <laughs> that against this level of competition? How, how did just, you go from it, the middle to the top? Yeah, it was not normal that you would do that. It usually takes a long, you know, much longer time to get good at cycling because the tactics are pretty complicated. There are some times that just brute strength wins the day, but you have to position yourself throughout the day to get to that point which takes most people, myself included, a long time. So to ha have a surplus of, of the strength required is, is, uh, is critical, but generally it's not, the trajectory is not usually that steep. So they were like, okay, <laughs> okay, Bob, you have your own category now, apparently. <laughs> right? Did, did you feel like you were better at that cerebral part, the, the tactics before no, your competition? No, I was horrible. I was, How'd you get good at that? It took me until I started watching it and commentating on it to actually understand the nuances better. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Who, who taught you the best? Listening to Phil and Paul, actually, and working with them, I started to learn more about the tactical nuances of cycling. But when we were racing, I'm going to clobber everybody. So this it was that great. spirit that got you over the top. Yeah, that fighting spirit, for sure. So you're winning in Northern California. You proved you could do it there. Yeah. At what point did you wake up and say, I need, I need more? than just what can be offered locally. I need to get over there. Yeah, there I, being Europe. that was a pretty much right when I started. I was like, I'm racing in Europe. That's, I'm, I don't know how, but that's, that's what I'm gonna do. You My club mates, the same guys. Yeah. There, that was the dream that everybody had, and nobody had really been doing that. Greg LeMond and George Mount were the only two pros ever, <laughs> Jock Boyer. Uh, all of them from the same district, by the way, NorCal, Nevada. And I was like, I'm doing that. And my clubmates, 
previously mentioned who had seen me, they're like, you're not doing Perry Roubaix. I'm like, oh, yes, I am. I'm doing it. <laughs> So two years later, they saw me in the coverage. The final standings again, Sean Kelly wins his second Paris-Roubaix. And Bob Roll in 55th becomes only the third American ever to finish the race. How'd you get from your friends doubting you yeah. to making it over there Europe and well, like competing? I, like I started like having, you know, a level of fitness that uh, enabled me to, you know, be a just, you know, considerably more successful than most of the club riders, the local riders. And so the 7-Eleven team had to chase me. <laughs> Every time they raced uh, anywhere in the West or the Coors Classic was a big race at the time, they found themselves chasing me every single race. <laughs> so a position opened up at the Tour of Italy, the Giro d'Italia, and they said, you know, we've been chasing this guy. Why don't we hire him and then we won't have to chase him anymore. Hmm. Everybody else will have to chase him. <laughs> but before you got there, your, your journey from Northern California to Europe, I mean, there were, there were some long months there before you were noticed where you were literally yeah. living on your own. Yeah. I just wanted to be there so bad. I didn't care what the circumstances were. And so let's go back to the actual time when you decided to go from California to Europe, how, how you paid for it and where you yeah. ended up. Winning that race at Mount Diablo, mm -hmm. I made like $2,000. I thought I won the lottery. Thought you were rich. I thought, oh my God, I, two th I mean, the stack of bills, I put them on top of each other. I was like, oh my God, I'm rich. What'd you do with it? <laughs> I went to Switzerland to race for a year. And I lived off that money for, for two trips to Europe, three months at the end of that year in Belgium, and then the next year, the whole year in Switzerland. I could only afford to live in a tent. <laughs> Hold on a second. So you, you, you took your $2,000, your, your prize money, yeah. picked Switzerland, yeah. and just showed up. Yeah. Like you, when you got to the airport, where did you go? What did you I do? I had written a letter to the Swiss Cycling Federation and told them, I'm coming to Switzerland. I want to race. Did they invite you? No. No, they just <laughs> they said, okay, when you get to Zurich Airport, call this number. Okay, he called that number and what happened? That was a man called George Probst and he had a bike shop near Geneva. And so he hooked me up with a, a place to stay outside of Baden, Switzerland, near Zurich. Stayed there for a few days and then it was like, where am I gonna live? Yeah. And I was at a race, a weekly race, that all the Swiss stars went to. And it was a criterium in a military base. So, and you could see the entire circuit it was a parade ground and there was no buildings in between the circuit and the start finish line. And so they made an announcement <laughs> over the PA, this guy needs a place to stay. And so somebody came over, one of the coaches of the local teams and said, I know where there's a camping ground and they have tents that they rent out. And he thought I was gonna be there for, you know, three or four days. And uh, I'm like, give me six months. <laughs> six months in a tent. <laughs> yes. Really? And then I did three more because it wasn't the end of the season yet. So. Okay. So then I'm sitting there in my tent, <laughs> don't know anybody. I didn't speak the language, but I, I had my bike and I could put it in the tent and my little sleeping cot. And I rode six, seven, eight, nine hours every day all over the country. And then I would race on the weekends. I didn't have anything else going on. What'd Nothing. you do when you got back to your, your tent? I had a little radio, and I'll tell you, the, I heard a Bruce Springsteen song. Which one? Born in the USA. Mm. It saved my life. How so? I don't know why. I just got this feeling like, okay, I can do this. And then started racing really well. And there was a German DJ that played American songs from 8 to 9 p.m. across the border. And so I would turn my little dial and move the antenna to try to find his show, and it was in English. So I would sit there on my, on my cot and listen to Bruce Springsteen and Aretha Franklin and Ray Charles, and I just knew that everything was gonna be okay. Was it like having a piece of home with you? Yeah, exactly. You learned a lot about cycling, a lot about yourself, those nine months in a tent. Where'd you go from there? Then I came back to the States and I was, you know, I was actually one of the hardest parts of my whole career because nobody knew how good I had become. How'd Wanted, you prove it? I had this moment, like I couldn't even get on a local club to get, you know, a bicycle and a jersey. Why? 
that nobody knew who I was. There was no internet. There was no, oh my God, this dude's kicking ass in Europe. Oh, that guy won that Mount Diablo thing a couple years ago, but he must have, you know, gotten a job like everybody else. So that was like, oh no, like my career is going to be over before it ever got started. And that was probably the worst, the lowest point for me. And I was like, that just doesn't, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> what got you out of that low point? There was a local team that got started called Mug Root Beer and they were recruiting uh, riders, and it was sort of a lengthy you know, interview process, and they only had a few spots, and I just elbowed my way on that team, and a few weeks later, 7-Eleven asked me to do the Giro. What got them to notice you, you think? My coach on some of the clubs I raced for had been hired by 7-Eleven to manage them during the Giro. His name was Mike Neal, and so I owe a lot of my career to Mike Neal inviting me to be on that team. He and I sort of followed the upward trajectory of the team in Europe um, for the subsequent years. And Giro so, 1985, I believe that yeah. was your first Grand Tour? First pro race. Top memory of that? It was this, this band of lunatics. We came in like extraterrestrials. They were not stoked. <laughs> they didn't like the idea that their sport was about to change fundamentally. They did not like that. Ron Kiefel now earns uh, the first very significant stage win for an American besides Craig LeMond. Here is another American rider winning a stage in a major international stage race, the Giro d'Italia. Ron Kiefel gets his chance to spray the crowd with champagne and enjoy a little bit of it himself. Your first Grand Tour, when you're at the starting line, do you remember feeling like, I have arrived, I belong here, I'm one of these guys, I'm going to be successful, or were there moments of doubt that you had to be back Yeah, down? I was... You know, they called me on Tuesday. I left that afternoon. I got there Wednesday. We started Friday. You didn't have time to think about it. So I was pretty shell-shocked. Yeah. You know, I looked over. There's Bernardino. I'm like, wow, Bernardino, okay. Well, we're theoretically in the same event. <laughs> it was too overwhelming, honestly, to think, okay, this is my dream. I've made it. I was like, okay, I just have to survive until I feel better. But you eventually rode six Grand Tours, three Giros, three I'd Tours. I'd say seven. Phil and Paul have said you only did three Tours, but I did four. <laughs> yeah. So I started four okay. Tours and three Giros start to finish. So right. seven Grand Tours. So it was overwhelming and fast with the yeah. first one. It happened in a hurry. Yeah. At what point did you feel like, I belong here. I'm one of these guys. Yeah, no, the second one was the Tour in 86, which was the hardest thing I've ever done professionally. Our team of 10 started, only five guys made it to Paris, and every guy went through, you know, at least six layers of Dante's Inferno. You know, we're down there by, by sticks, the lake of fire, like looking into the abyss, half the freaking race. It's unbelievable how hard these races are. You know, there's all these guys that are going for it, and when they get out there, they work really hard. It's about 50% faster, 200% uh, longer, and 100% uh, harder. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's nothing like it. It's unbelievable. We haven't got to the hard part yet. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> uh, in other words, to describe it. We're bad to the bone. At least the first day. We'll see the rest of the race how it goes. It's the famous battle between Lamond and Eno, and they were just murdering each other every day. And the whole rest of the peloton was just in shambles behind them. And I was one of those guys just like, oh my God, I don't know, this sport, this sport might be too tough. What moments made you feel that way? Well, I got dysentery. So three nights, I was sick as a dog and never slept and lost three, four, five kilos. But you kept going. I, I kept going to the finish. Mm. And it changed me physically. I was much more capable of handling how arduous the sport is. The rigors of the sport became uh, an afterthought. I didn't have to, at, after that, I was a different bike rider. What was the hardest moment for you in that 86 tour? Probably the second time I got sick, um, the whole peloton was staying in a gymnasium and we were all on our cots. And I, at dinner, I just started feeling queasy and I'm like, oh no, I mean, this is horrible, you know? And so all night I was going back and forth to the bathroom being sick and I'd pack my bag 
gave it to the soigneur and said, I'm going to go to the feed zone and I'm getting in the car and we're going to the, uh, we're going to the airport. I'm, uh, uh, and there was no other transportation alternative. You know, there wasn't a flotilla of support vehicles. We had two sedans. That's it. And, and so I, I put my suitcase in the soigneur's car so they could, I could go to the feed and they would hand off the feed bags to my teammates, and then we would go to the airport. So I get to the feed zone, and the race had been like full gas, and it was splitting apart, and somehow I was in the first split, because I wanted to get to the feed zone so I could drop out. <laughs> and so our soigneur, Shelly Versus, sees me coming and instinctively holds out the feed bag. And me, like a moron, I grabbed it, and I put it on just like without thinking. Got through the feed zone, in the first group, I'm like, wait a minute, I, I was supposed to drop out. Put the food in my pocket, my appetite came back to me. I, so I started eating and drinking and uh, finished the stage. So the next day, the whole peloton was like, I, I can't believe that guy is still in this race. It's impossible. Yeah. It could not wipe me out. <laughs> what did that do to your confidence and the, the respect that you knew that you gained from the peloton? I, I mean, the respect came later, but f I was still not well. So I was worried. I was still very, very worried. But I did decide that no way I'm dropping out of this. I'm going to Paris. And you made it. And I made yeah. it. And coming over that last climb by Versailles and seeing the Arc de Triomphe and the Eiffel Tower and the circuit with a million people on it, mm -hmm. I was one of the best moments in my whole sporting, my sporting life. And the feeling of accomplishment, I was just like, I was like, oh, my God. God, I can't believe I made it. <laughs> and I knew I was going to finish at that point. You so, know, and up until then, it was like could have gone either yeah. way. <laughs> so finishing the 86 tour, which was your first tour, yeah. you were also part of a team at the Giro that won. Next time we did the Giro, we so won. Being we part won. of a winning team or finishing the 86 tour, which Grand Tour memory is more yeah, cherished for I you? I think the 86 tour is to just get absolutely pulverized for a month and not give up. For me personally, mm -hmm. for in the team history and the, how good we became a couple years later, the second time we did the Giro, we won the Giro, you know, and uh, and so that for the team and and the legend of the 7-Eleven cycling team, that's probably the high point. But for me personally, it was the 86 Tour. Coming up on Off Script with Bob Roll, everybody was against you. We had to race the whole peloton by ourselves. They were like, okay, these dudes are losing. That's what they decided. 